Uh, thanks to Greg Milford. Our, our last speaker will be uh, Neil Smith, and then we'll uh, have the opportunity for uh, questions. These are some uh, very interesting presentations that are very hard to follow um, on from. But let me uh, really summarize uh, three things I think that I really want to do. The first thing is I want to insist on how momentous the events of last year were, 2011, and try and explain that uh, in a little, uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a very short period. Second, I want to argue, um, perhaps over-optimistically, that we can see neoliberalism as dead but dominant, to use the language that Habermas once used actually about uh, modernity, dead but dominant. Uh, third, I want to argue, and this is maybe the crux of it, that what's happened as a result of 2011 has been an extraordinary opening up politically, especially in North America, uh, but also in other parts of the world um, in a way that was not visible a few years ago. Um, but that we need to temper that with a sense of the kind of repression that's coming down. So that's really the argument that I'm making. Let me start with the first point, which is how momentous the events of, of last year uh, were. Um, I think it's fair to say that what 2011 signified was a process of radical opening up of politics that we've been witnessing perhaps over the last 10 years. The uh, revolts in North Africa and Southwest Asia, the Arab Spring as it's sometimes called, I'm, I'm not as happy with that language, but um, uh, the events in North Africa and Southwest Asia, one. The European anti-austerity revolts, uh, two. Uh, which have really built up and which we haven't yet talked about in, in, in this panel. Um, there's so much to talk about. Um, three, Wisconsin and what happened in Wisconsin and particularly the fact that the local police really had to be displaced by the state troopers if any kind of order was going to be maintained in Wisconsin. That is an extraordinary event to have happened in 2011. Occupy, uh, which of course we know about and we saw what happened last night and we'll come back to that. Uh, I would like to also say the events in Chile um, since the autumn and the movement in Chile and we've heard a lot more about events in, in, in Latin America that we could um, pile into this. But the other thing I think that we haven't mentioned either is the level of extraordinary class struggle going on in China. Um, the news coming out of China very rarely reflects how much labor struggle and other forms of struggles over land and housing uh, are taking place. Uh, land, housing and I should say environment as well. Um, the Communist Party in China in 2007 conceded that in the year of 2006 there had been 74,000 events of riots, strikes, uh, violent attacks, uh, of people more or less organized against the state or against private uh, corporations. Of, and when you talk about private corporations in China, of course, it can become complicated because the, the ownership is obviously complex. Um, but all of these events have happened, and we haven't even begun to talk about Maoists organizing in rural India and many, many other kinds of events. So the first argument I really want to make is that as a result of the events of 2011, we have to see a real radical openness of political possibilities on the table in a way that I think was impossible, especially in, in, in North America, was impossible for us to see um, even five years ago. Uh, now, all of these events have precursors. It didn't suddenly just happen in 2011, of course, granted. And we could go back and, 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 and look at how events emerged. Um, but I think that we need to take what happened in 2011 symbolically. The second argument then that I really want to get at is this notion 
that neoliberalism is dead but dominant. Uh, and what I mean by that? Well, I think we can identify about half a dozen events uh, over the last 12 to 15 years uh, that suggest the ways in which neoliberalism is dead. I'm just going to run through these extremely quickly. There's a lot more to be said about all of them. The first is the economic crisis, often called the Asian economic crisis, a total misnomer because it was much more global uh, than simply Asian, but that really affected uh, the global economy from 97 to 99. Why was that important? For the first time, uh, what you had was committed neoliberals such as Jeffrey Sachs, Joseph Stieglitz and others, uh, perhaps less notable, they having been involved in the IMF and World Bank, uh, respectively, jumping ship and openly saying that neoliberalism was failing to bring about the promise that it had made. And this was coming from the inside. Second, you've got the anti-globalization movement, which whatever our critiques were of it and how it both faded but also moved on, I think the anti-globalization movement has to be given considerable credit for putting on the table the fact that there was an alternative. The damage of Margaret Thatcher's notion of there is no alternative, and let's say the, 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 the violence of neoliberalism, which is real and physical in many places, part of that violence also was to the left itself. It was the left that tragically came to believe in many places that there was no alternative. And what the anti-globalization movement began to argue um, at the end of the 20th century, the first years of the 21st, uh, was precisely that there was an alternative. We've heard earlier uh, from, uh, about, the, um, about the, the Iraq war. It seems to me that the Iraq war, um, indeed, as Phyllis says, was a total failure, uh, even within the terms by which the United States led a coalition in there. But it was also an act of gross diplomatic incompetence, and we could um, uh, uh, extend a discussion on that for quite a while. But what the Iraq war has done uh, eventually uh, over, its, over its, its years is to get rid of the entire language of a Washington consensus. It's clear today that there is no such thing as a Washington consensus and we don't simply hear about it. The optimism of the end of history from Francis Fukuyama has given way to his new article called The Future of History. <laughs> and so these are really important signs of the dramatic shift it seems to me that has taken place. The fourth is of course um, the Latin American revolts and Greg covered that so I'm not even going to um, bother to go over that material. The fifth thing I think that we obviously need to look at is the economic crisis since 2007. Uh, it's an economic crisis that perhaps many of us in North America and Europe are experiencing as a crisis, but at the same time we have to modulate that, I think, very appropriate historical sense of a shift with the notion that the majority of the world's people were always already in crisis and that that shift um, has a limit to it, important as it is. And it's a response to, the, to that crisis in particular that seems to me that's going to change the world as much as the crisis uh, itself. Uh, again, there's much more that can be said about that. And of course, the sixth set of events, and I'm going to lump them together uh, precisely because I think Phyllis is correct about um, the influence of the revolts in North Africa and Southwest Asia uh, on something like Occupy, but the revolts that took place last year in North Africa and Southwest Asia, coupled then with an Occupy movement that not just came from the United States, in fact actually the idea was hatched in Vancouver as I'm sure many of you know, um, but that began occupied space in uh, the United States, that event became in some ways global. Now, where does all this leave us? It seems to me that while we can be optimistic and see the opening up that has taken place as a result of those events and that we um, temper our sense of the importance of 2011 with a sense also of the precursors, we also have to temper it with a sense of the opposite side of the coin. Uh, 
because it seems to me that, that um, we're now facing a situation probably best described by the head of police in London after um, student revolts and sit-ins and so on in 2010. Not the most recent riots in London, but before that, November 2010, uh, the head of the Metropolitan Police came out and said in a quite publicised statement, the game has changed. The game has changed. Now, when he said that, it was less than a year after uh, the uh, um, imperial historian, if I can put it that way, Neil Ferguson, uh, came to Toronto and was published, was, was cited in the front pages of the newspaper saying that as a result of the economic crisis, there will be blood. And so it seems to me you put those two together, you begin to get a sense of how the game has changed. Why has it changed? Well, there's a whole number of different kinds of explanations, but I want to try out um, one thing on you about how I think it's changed, because I think this will help to explain the other side of the coin. I think we've actually begun to forget um, a very central lesson that the uh, that Marxists and that feminists uh, really came up with loudly in the 1970s and going into the 1980s. In particular, the role of the welfare state. Neoliberalism has not smashed the welfare state. It has not dismantled all the welfare state. It's a very uneven process. The German welfare state is still much more intact than in many other places, uh, less so perhaps the American. Uh, but it's very uneven. Marxists and feminists argued in the 1970s that one of the functions centrally of the welfare state was precisely to maintain social control, social security. That's why it's called social security. When we were looking at the 20s or 30s or 40s when the various programs came in uh, within the American empire but also uh, in, in, in Europe. We could go back further before the 20s if we wanted to. Um, that's why it's called social security. It's security against a revolt of the population within the country, not security against external threats. And so to the extent that a neoliberal um, moment of capitalism uh, has indeed brought about a certain dismantling of some parts of the nation state, that very purpose of ensuring social security has itself been dismantled. And what's left when you take apart the comparatively um, uh, secondary, secondary or second degree levels of securitization is precisely the, the military forms of securitization, securitization of public space, uh, and, and, and so on, those step into the breach. And it seems to me that's exactly what we're seeing. And so when I argue that things are radically open right now, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to want to maintain that, some of you are going to surely tell me I'm way too optimistic, but I do think there's a radical openness going on. That's countered by the opposite. And so it's clear, you, what happened last night was totally predictable. And it's actually still um, not the levels of securitization that are prepared. The Occupy movement, um, in having been dismantled, is going to have to reconstruct itself in some form, but to do so knowing that the level of uh, uncertainty in the ruling class that came down in October and November last year has, get, has gone, has vanished. They've regrouped, and that's exactly what last night was all about. That the levels of repression that are now available to come in are stunning compared to quite anything that we've ever seen before. Um, so it seems to me that's the first lesson that has to come out of this. And I think we can see a connection right back to neoliberalism. I want to be clear about this. This isn't just post-2001. Again, there are precursors to this, and that's the point about the analysis of the welfare state. Um, it also, I think, jives nicely with Michael's argument about third worlding at home, um, to, to, to use that language that I think um, this kind of third world is, worlding is exactly um, marked by the kinds of repression um, that we're likely to see um, and that we need to fight against. So 
I'm going to insist on a radical openness. It's open not just because all the possibilities are on the table and aren't going to be um, uh, countered. It is open because I think we can now see the possibility of a challenge to capitalism uh, that was probably not as visible to us in the past. In taking on that challenge, I think we need to at the same time be totally aware uh, and sober about the kinds of repression that are uh, available and are quite predictably going to come down. So, thank you.